Good evening. Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome to Orientale Lumen 4. For those of you who I've not yet met, my name is Jack Figgle, the conference chairman, and I would like to sincerely welcome you to this fourth annual event that when we started four years ago, uh, we had no idea it would become annual, but your presence here, I think, demonstrates uh, the, the desire of what this event stands for, and I thank you for coming. Before we get into formal welcoming uh, remarks, I would like to introduce Archbishop Sevilla to lead us in an opening prayer. Your Eminence. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray to the Lord our God, to look mercifully upon us and send down the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and piety, and the fear of him into our hearts, our minds, and our lips. May he enlighten us by the light of his discernment that we may be adorned with all the good works for the glory of this most holy name and for the good of our people. O Lord, send us your comforting spirit upon us, O good one. Renew your Holy Spirit in our hearts of all of us who have gathered together in your name for this assembly. Grant us wisdom and power to confess your truth with boldness and to preserve the ecclesiastical traditions without change. We pray to you, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you, Your Eminence. This Orientale Lumen IV conference is co-sponsored by the Society of St. John Chrysostom, which was founded some four years ago here in the United States at the first OL conference. Those of you who were present for that, uh, I welcome you back. Uh, and uh, we have uh, this year for the first time an icon of St. John Chrysostom who will look down upon us through our deliberations in this room, through our conference, uh, and we hope that he will be with us in spirit as we continue to learn from each other through the course of the next several days. The other co-sponsor of this event is the School of Religious Studies here at the Catholic University of America. And it's my great honor and privilege to introduce the dean of that school, who's with us this evening, uh, to say a few words of welcome to our conference, Father Stephen Happel. Father Stephen. to speak for the university in welcoming you all, your eminences, your grace, um, and all those of us who are interested in the world of, and the worlds of ecumenism. The School of Religious Studies itself uh, has always been profoundly both influenced by and committed to the issues of ecumenism, East and West. And it is our hope in the future that we will be able to put into an institutional form 
this sense of not only ecumenism but also of studying the Eastern churches in the, the, even in the contemporary world as well as in the ancient world. Um, my predecessor, Father Raymond Collins, who is actually flying somewhere to give a talk and will be back uh, before uh, the end of tomorrow for his talk here, um, and Jack Fiegel should be uh, commended for the work that they have done over the last four years in making this conference possible and making it work. I think it's no small testament, uh, testimony to the work of the core participants and to the moderators that it's possible in this fourth year to choose the sacrament of the Eucharist as a central experience about which we can speak. The very worship that we cannot all share together completely, we are willing to discuss and pray over and think about as a way toward unity in the future. I think that will be the gift of the Spirit to us. Uh, I look forward to that day personally, and I'm sure we all do as a community, when it is possible for us to share completely and equally uh, that sacrament together. The School of Religious Studies then welcomes you all. Um, my president, who hoped to be here, uh, got waylaid, as you probably can guess, by the installation of the new Archbishop in New York. And so that's where he is tonight, although he had hoped to be here and welcome you himself. The provost, who will be with us later in the week, actually, toward the end of the conference, is at a conference on the West Coast uh, about academics and couldn't be here as well. So um, the world of the university is going to be represented by some of the faculty of the School of Religious Studies and other faculty in the Washington area. But I'm very grateful for your willingness to share your wisdom and your knowledge with us. I look forward to many long years of Orientale Lumen. Um, that's, of course, if um, all of our participants can uh, continue with the same energy that they seem to have this evening. I was told several times tonight already that this is a unique conference, not just here in the United States, but in the world. It is with great gratitude to Almighty God that uh, I ask God to bless us and bless this conference as we continue the week and continue the work of speaking together in charity and in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Father Stephen, for that uh, uh, kind welcome and, and warm hospitality that the School of Religious Studies and the University has uh, given us over the years and especially this year uh, as well. Um, and as those of you who have been here before know that our tradition is to give a small sto token of appreciation to uh, special guests of honor as, as yourself and, and our speakers uh, is an icon of remembrance from the event. Um, the, the conference uh, thanks you very much uh, for your support and kindness over uh, or the organization of it and, and all the work in the past. So if you'd please come up and uh, accept this token of our appreciation. Yes, please. For those of you in the back, it's, it's the icon of the Holy Supper in, in memory of the theme, and you'll see that there's an inscribed plaque on the back, uh, Orientale Lumen, for your participation. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you all. Next, it, it gives me a um, great deal of personal pleasure um, to, uh, rather than speak and welcome you myself, as I've done in past years, but to simply read to you two letters of greeting uh, that I've received by fax in the last uh, week, um, which I think uh, speak for themselves, and so I won't comment upon them. The first is actually addressed to His Eminence Cardinal Hickey, the Archbishop of Washington, uh, and I will read it. It's dated from the Vatican on June the 5th, the year 2000. Dear Cardinal Hickey, the Holy Father was pleased to learn that on June 19 to 23rd, 2000, 
the fourth Oriental Illumin Conference will be held at the Catholic University of America. He asks you kindly to convey all present his cordial greetings and the assurance of his close pastoral interest. His Holiness prays that the conference, which this year has taken as its theme, Eucharist, a prayer for unity, will contribute to the growth of communion among Catholics and Orthodox by promoting a fruitful theological dialogue sustained by the dialogue of love. During this holy year of the great Jubilee of the Incarnation, he invites all taking part in the conference to discover in the great tradition of the first Christian millennium a source of renewed inspiration for their efforts to proclaim the gospel to the contemporary world and to foster that communion founded on unity of faith, which will find its fulfillment in the Collins celebration of the Holy Eucharist. It is his hope that following the example of the first disciples gathered around the apostles, Christians in our time will, quote, strive fervently to conform their thinking and action to the will of the Holy Spirit, the principle of the church's unity, so that all who have been baptized in the one spirit as members of the one body may be brothers and sisters joined in the celebration of the same Eucharist, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, taken from the encyclical letter Dominum et vivificantem. With these sentiments, the Holy Father commends the work of the conference to the intercession of the Holy Mother of God, radiant model of the earthly church, as she makes her pilgrim way to the consolation and peace of the heavenly Jerusalem. Upon all taking part, he cordially invokes an outpouring of the Holy Spirit's gifts of wisdom, understanding, and strength. Sincerely yours, G.B. Ray, who I believe is the Holy Father's private secretary. The other letter uh, is addressed to Oriental Illumin 4. I greet most warmly the participants at the Oriental Illumin 4 conference, which will be meeting in Washington in the coming days. I recall with pleasure and satisfaction my presence at the Oriental Illumin 2 conference in 1998. These annual meetings have brought together members of the hierarchy, theologians, and involved persons from the Catholic and Orthodox churches for discussions on themes of particular interest to our ongoing dialogue. As is well known, the next meeting of the Joint Commission for the Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church will be held in Baltimore next month. This will be a particularly important meeting and we shall be grateful to those attending the Oriental Illumin 4 conference if they would offer prayers for its successful outcome. You are meeting at a time when our churches are celebrating the Feast of Pentecost in this great Jubilee year. May the Holy Spirit guide your discussions and bring them to a successful conclusion. I look forward in due course to receiving good news of your conference and I ask God blessings on all those participating in your conference. Dated Rome, 16th of June, Signed, Edward Idris Cardinal Cassidy, President of the Pontifical Council for Promoting <coughs> Christian Unity. I think these letters speak for themselves. And I would like to next introduce, uh, to say a few words, and also to read another letter that we have received, uh, His Eminence Archbishop Sevalod. Uh, I'd like to point out Archbishop Sevalod uh, recently uh, was invited to be a member of the official delegation that will visit Rome for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul uh, next week, June the 29th, when, a, by tradition, a delegation from uh, the Orthodox Church visits and, and uh, is present for the uh, Roman Catholic celebration of Saints Peter and Paul Feast Day, uh, the Mass that will be offered in St. Peter's. Uh, His Eminence Archbishop Sevalod will join with uh, Metropolitan John of Pergamon and Archdeacon Tarasius from the Patriarchate of Constantinople in that delegation. Uh, and as I was talking earlier in the weekend, uh, it seems in our best recollection, this is probably the first time that a American and non-Greek has been appointed as official member of the delegation uh, since these traditional exchanges have been occurring. So your eminence, we are very honored that you are here with us and you will be here with our conference. We're also very grateful for your ongoing support uh, and co-patronage of the Society of St. John Chrysostom, uh, and we welcome your comments and uh, 
your presence this evening. So, Archbishop Sevalod. Thank you, Mr. Fiegel, for your kind words. I will be brief. Uh, I'll refrain from reading from the ancient Byzantine Greek and read it in English. Uh, greetings from His All Holiness, the Patriarch Bartolomeo. To the Honorable Jack Fiegel, Chairman of the Oriental Lumen Four Conference, President of the Society of St. John Chrysostomus. Beloved child of our concern, grace and peace to you from God. With great enthusiasm, we have read your letter of April 24th, in which you zealously shared with us the program for the assembly on the Eucharist, prayer for unity, and ask for our patriarchal blessing. Our Lord Jesus Christ has told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Indeed, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Surely, elements of truth are to be thought in all teachings, but the fullness of the truth comes only in him, in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells. One who assiduously wills to fulfill the heart and mind with the truth must love like a bee, gathering honey from all the flowers. When with hope and faith that one discovers what is suitable to harvest for the blending for all that is has been collected from all the flowers, he or she must be like the merchant of the parable, who having found the pearl of great price, sold all the possessions and bought it. So also someone who seeks the one and most precious good must leave aside all other riches, even semi-precious riches, until he or she finds that one thing that is worth striving after. Our Lord Jesus Christ also told us that the tree is known by its fruits. One who experienced the life of Christ, the Apostle Paul dares to say, I no longer live, Christ lives in me. He also said that no one can say Lord Jesus Christ except by the Holy Spirit. And likewise, he assured us the fruits of the Holy Spirit by which he gives a sign of his existence are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These fruits are the basic criteria by which spiritual realities are judged. They are necessary because it has been set forth, according to St. John, the theologian, that Christ be confessed by them as coming into the world in the flesh. Consequently, the search for truth and unity should be a matter of gathering diverse truth, forming from them a single whole, assembling different human voices into single melody, embodying them with us into the one body of the living Christ and experiencing his life in the Holy Spirit. Thus the journey into the different Christian traditions and voices is appropriate for the search for truth, the search for the living Christ, the search for life in the Holy Spirit made fruitful in Christ. Unity, however, has its center and its limits, the common life of Christ in the Spirit. Therefore, we wholeheartedly pray for you and for all who call on the name of Christ, longing simply and preserving it to meet him, the one truth, so to gain access to and knowledge of the Lord 
in whom alone dwells all who are moved with great surprise in the Holy Spirit. The grace of the risen Lord and infinite mercy be with you, and may he lead the path of all of us to him. May 29, 2000, Bartolomeo I, Archbishop of Constantinople. Thank you. Your Eminence, in recognition of your ongoing support and, again, your participation in this, the fourth Oriental Illumin Conference, we likewise have an icon gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to uh, express um, some very humble and sincere regrets on the part of our other co-patron, Bishop John Michael Botin, the Bishop of the Romanian Greek Catholic Church here in the United States, who's based in Canton, Ohio. Uh, Bishop John Michael has been at all three previous Oriental Illumin conferences, uh, and as I mentioned, is the co-patron of our Society of St. John Chrysostom. Uh, unfortunately, some pastoral uh, necessities in his diocese requires him to stay in Canton this coming week, uh, and he sincerely uh, offers his apologies and asks for your prayers uh, that he will not be able to join us for the week. Uh, he had intended to be here for the entire conference and to fully participate, and it's also a, a personal sadness on my part that, that he will not be able to be with us. Uh, but uh, I know that his prayers are with us. Uh, I've spoken to him a number of times uh, in the last week, uh, and he indicated that uh, he would be remembering us uh, during the course of the week, and uh, I will probably be in touch with him by phone once or twice as well. So uh, uh, he extends his uh, continued blessings on us uh, and, uh, uh, again, apologizes that he will not be able to join us, but uh, when you're a bishop, sort of, you know, things happen. So. He, uh, he won't be able to be here. Uh, likewise, I would like to pass on to you greetings and uh, similar regrets on the part of the editor of Eastern Church's Journal, Father Serge Kelleher, who has also been here in the past three years uh, at the Oriental Illumin Conferences. Uh, Father Serge, as some of you may know, uh, is actually based in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he lives there travels the world and participates in conferences and other, other assignments that his bishop, uh, Bishop Basil Lawson of uh, Stamford, Connecticut, assigns him to. Uh, and right now, uh, his small little parish in Dublin has grown by leaps and bounds uh, over the last 12 months. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to travel to Ireland for Pascha on the Julian calendar this year. Uh, and he had 90 people at his small little chapel uh, in Dublin for Resurrection Matins and Liturgy. Uh, and since he is a main speaker at the OL conference in Melbourne, Australia in mid-July, he indicated that he uh, just could not uh, arrange to be gone from Ireland for so long a period uh, and so many days, so to speak, since uh, uh, he understands he's the only Greek Catholic priest in all of Ireland. Uh, so uh, he felt that uh, being uh, off to Australia for a two-week trip and also coming here to be with us was just perhaps a bit much travel uh, for his parish to, to take. So he likewise sends his greetings uh, and his warm regards to everyone here uh, at the conference, uh, but uh, he will not be able to join us uh, this coming week. So that brings us to uh, introducing our co-moderator, um, who will be uh, speaking to us for a few minutes this evening about our theme to kind of get us into the the spirit of it, if you will, uh, into the content of the deliberations and our discussions. Uh, His Grace Bishop Kalostos uh, will be speaking to us in a plenary session tomorrow evening. And after his few remarks this evening, I will um, have a quick review of our program tomorrow so everyone's aware of what's going on and what's happening and where we're to be and so forth. And at the end of each of our plenary sessions, I will have similar sorts of announcements uh, at, the, uh, at the end 
uh, where we uh, handle logistics. As the chairman of the conference, uh, I'm in charge of logistics and our moderator, moderators are in charge of the content of the program. So uh, I will have a few remarks at the end of Bishop Callistus' uh, talks uh, this evening and we will hear more from him again tomorrow night. So without further ado, Bishop Callistos of Diocleo, your grace. Our theme at this conference is Eucharist, a prayer for unity. We are here to reflect during the next three days on the connection between the Eucharist on the one hand and on the other, our unity or lack of it. Now, that there is a connection between the Eucharist and unity is immediately evident when we recall the words of St. Paul, words that we might take as a, the text for our conference. From 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 to 17. The bread that we break is a communion with the body of Christ. The fact that there is only one loaf means that though there are many of us, we form a single body because we all share in this one loaf. So there St. Paul speaks of first the many persons eating from the one loaf, and then of the many persons constituting one body in Christ. Between communion in the one Eucharistic loaf and membership in the one body of Christ, Paul asserts not just an analogy, but a causal connection because we eat from the one loaf therefore we are made one body in Christ on St. Paul's line of thinking the Eucharist actualizes the oneness of the church what holds the church together? Surely not external power of jurisdiction, but sharing in the sacraments. The unity of the church is not imposed from without by juridical authority. The unity of the church is created from within by sharing in Holy Communion. The Eucharist creates the unity of the Church. What then are we to say if we do not share together in the Eucharist? And what does that imply for our living out of the unity of the Church? Now, the same connection that Paul asserts in 1 Corinthians 10 between eating from one loaf and constituting one body in Christ is also brought out significantly in the most ancient liturgical text that we possess, the Didache, or teaching of the Twelve Apostles, perhaps late 1st century or early 2nd century. In the Didache, we have this prayer. As this broken bread was scattered over the mountains and was then brought together and became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. So we note, as before, the interdependence of church and Eucharist. We are to think 
of the ears of wheat growing scattered on the upland slopes. And then we are to think of those ears of wheat gathered together on the threshing floor, ground into flour, baked to form a single loaf. And by sharing in this one loaf, the scattered members of the human race are gathered into the living, organic unity of the church. So there we have precisely the same link affirmed in the Didache as in 1 Corinthians 10. Link between the oneness of the Eucharistic loaf, the oneness of the church. Let us also note the creative ambiguity in two familiar phrases. And these phrases are body of Christ and communio sanctorum. Body of Christ means both the sacrament, Holy Communion, and it means the community of the faithful, the church. And this double meaning is not a coincidence. Because the church and the Eucharist are integrally connected. Again, communio sanctorum can mean communion of saints, communion of holy persons, understanding sanctorum to be masculine, but it's equally possible grammatically to understand it as meaning communion in the holy things, as neuter. And once more, this is not a coincidence, because it is through communion in the holy things that the communion of the holy persons is made real. This should lead us to reflect that our disunity at the Lord's table is a sin against the very essence of the church as a Eucharistic community. The tragic character of our divisions will be brought home to us this week at the celebrations of the Eucharist at which we cannot communicate together. Tomorrow morning, for example, at the celebration of the Divine Liturgy, it is a great sadness to me that I cannot invite the non-Orthodox to receive communion. I wish it were not so, but that is our situation at the moment, which we must respect. So then, may the Holy Spirit of Pentecost the feast that we've just been celebrating, swiftly consume our divisions in the fire of his love. Now perhaps we will end with prayer and then move on to the practical announcements. So, if you would like. <coughs> Let us commend ourselves to God, the Holy Trinity. O Father, my hope, O Son, my refuge, O Holy Spirit, my protection, Holy Trinity, glory to thee. 
Most Holy Mother of God, save us. Meet it is of a truth to call thee blessed, who didst bring forth God, the ever-blessed and most pure, and the Mother of our God, more honored than the cherubim, incomparably more glorious than the seraphim, Thou who inviolate hast brought forth God the Word, truly the Mother of God, thee do we magnify. Glory to thee, O Christ, our God and our hope. Glory to thee. May he who sent down the Most Holy Spirit in the form of fiery tongues upon his holy disciples and apostles. Christ, our true God, at the prayers of his most pure and holy mother, by the power of the precious and life-giving cross, at the protection of the honored spiritual powers of heaven, the intercessions of the honored, glorious, and all-praised apostles, of our Father among the saints, John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, of the holy and righteous forebears of God, Joachim and Anna, and of all the saints, have mercy upon us and save us, for he is good and loves mankind. The prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Thank you, Your Grace, and don't worry, I won't be inviting you back up to receive your icon. We have that reserved for tomorrow evening after your presentation at St. Nicholas. If I do, it's the watch the third. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure you're not disappointed. There is one, but you'll have to work a little harder tomorrow night. <laughs> Thank you, Your Grace, for those uh, remarks and words of, of uh, inspiration for us to prepare for this week. It is my pleasure to invite His Beatitude, Metropolitan Theodosius, the Primate of the Orthodox Church in America, Archbishop of Washington, to say a few words to you. In the conference program, there is a letter signed by the Metropolitan saying that he's unfortunately not able to come. But sometimes things turn out better than expected and this is an example i have uh, met volan theodosius and i have known each other for uh, many years when we first met we were both students and i can remember the month and the year it was august in 1961 so 39 years we've known each other and you had just returned your beatitude from the holy mountain of Athos and I was just on my way for my first visit and you gave me many useful hints which I still keep with me in a red notebook particularly about what the food was like in the different monasteries. <laughs> so now May I invite the Metropolitan to say a few words to our conference. Your eminences and your graces and your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, originally, I was tied up, but the, as they say, the Holy Spirit, uh, we don't bind him. And uh, we just finished celebrating Holy Pentecost this weekend, and I was able to extend my stay in the Washington area so I would be able to come and to uh, at least visit and to uh, hear the first lecture, and we'll break bread together at lunch, and then I must be on my way. But uh, I remember receiving the first uh, letters from uh, the Center for the Journal, 
and I have uh, from volume one, number one, and I have followed the work of uh, the journal and also the conference. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us and guard us and show us the way. Many times uh, it is so difficult uh, for, uh, for us with our own limited mind, and, but uh, the wind blows where it wills. And I was very happy to be here because of the topic, the Eucharist. And I am very uh, uh, interested, as you know, uh, studied under Father Alexander Schmemann and uh, the Eucharistic revival, the revival of communion in the Orthodox Church in America. And so uh, I'm always open to hear uh, uh, new ideas, uh, and new uh, uh, translations, and to hear uh, what is going on in the Orthodox world and on the scholarly, because we are limited in our English language uh, as to what the directions are, and, and they have these nebulous uh, phrases, Ashtya nastoyate posvolit, if the rector so desires and blesses. But what is that? You have to go back and search what are the, the practices. So we hope and pray that this uh, conference will, will open uh, our eyes and our heart and our mind and that we will be able to grow in Jesus Christ. Thank you and God bless you. What you've just said, your beatitude about the Tipicon, speaks to my heart. Whenever you reach the point of real difficulty and are totally uncertain what to do next, if you look up in the Ustav, what it says is, and the rest as usual. <laughs> Thank you.